that enjoys drawings of anthro, and I'm not bringing in the sexual element. Let's just, my God, my phones are making a lot of noise. Yes, I'm wearing an adulting shirt with a libertarian flag behind me. The irony is not lost on me, but it's purely a coincidence. I want to respond to this Lotus Eaters video that I watched from, uh, what, five days ago. Uh, I'm sorry for the, <laughs> the cheap videography. I have been moving some things around. This shelf wasn't here before. Please excuse the crappy mic. Let's go. Hello. Now, I decided to make this video after I saw the reception of a podcast segment that I and my colleague Connor hosted on YouTube. Uh, yeah, yeah, you got nasty Connor comments. I argue for banning porn, mainly damage the psychological desire for this content. Uh huh. It's very interesting, so I would highly recommend it, but I no. want to continue the discussion on whether Come the Supreme on. Court's decision on Ashcroft and Free Speech Coalition was the correct one. I simply. They, they whine for a couple minutes about the comments. I don't really care about that. Um, let's see. So a victimless crime is one where either no one is directly physically harmed, but society doesn't approve of the act, like the transaction between a prostitute and her client, or where the only person directly harmed is the individual themselves, like when a person takes hard drugs. My major contention with this is that this idea of the victimless crime is centered on a presupposition which is known as John Stuart Mill's harm principle. Listen very carefully to this. Now, I don't agree with this principle, and consider it to have fostered some attitudes that have caused many of the problems that we see around us today. That part. Caused many of the problems we see around us today. He's saying that the harm principle behind libertarian attitudes is what has caused the problems that we see around us today. I am going to directly refute this. Wait until he explains his opposition mainly by implanting a live and let live mentality in a lot of people. To really get to the base of what I'm talking about, we'll need to start by analyzing this harm principle and see if it actually stands up to scrutiny. John Stuart Mill articulated his harm principle in his famous work on liberty, which was a defense of free speech. Quote, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Yes. Unquote. While I understand his intention here, which is the minimizing of harm, I do feel that this is an inadequate principle to fully organize a functional society around. You're going to hear how this guy... Now, I, these people are supposedly conservative, right-wing... You're going to hear how this guy basically justifies the crap that's gone on for the past 10 years. It only takes into account the immediate, direct, physical harm that comes from people's actions and has no room to consider the cultural and psychological damage that can develop over time when societies embrace negative and harmful behaviors. The physical harm. Now, first of all, the harm principle does not mean purely physical harm, so this is already a definitional problem. We're not talking about mere physical harm. If you steal money from someone, you haven't physically harmed that person. You have harmed them, but you haven't injured them. You haven't hurt their body. It's, it's not purely physical, but you have caused harm to them. You have deprived them of property. So you could kind of argue that it's physical, but the way that he puts it, he tries to minimize the position by emphasizing that physicality of it. No, it's not just your physical body, it's also your right to your property. Life, liberty, and property, those are the three things. Harming your body is harming your life. Harming your property is harming your property, but it's also harming something that you spent a portion of your life in exchange to acquire. So, just to be clear, it, we haven't gotten into any debunking yet, but notice the minimization to pure physical harm. And now that's really just sort of glossed over. We don't go into any further detail. But then, psychological harm. It's, it's social. It's, it's harm that's not... It's bad behavior, you know. We expand like, oh, this doesn't deal with all these bad behaviors. Well, dude, you've already changed over into... We want to control your behavior to be what we think is the correct behavior. 
and this narrow definition of harm as only direct physical harm opens the floodgates, allowing all sorts of previously forbidden behavior. Really? Really? Yeah. Keep listening. Harm can be interpreted in reality as many different things in many different circumstances, and how exactly the principle should be applied in theory isn't clear, but as far as I can tell, mm. the only way it's applied practically is any authority telling me I shouldn't do something that I want to do is evil. And he plays a movie clip. And yes, that is true. Any authority telling me to do something that I don't want to do or that I can't do something that I do want to do is inherently evil. Now, the vast majority of libertarians acknowledge that to some extent authority controlling things is a necessary evil, but it is inherently evil. What he's done is reduce this position to, oh, it's, it's just always evil. It's like, oh, libertarians? All of us pesky, liberty-loving people, the people who push the don't hurt other people principle, if anything that I want to do that you stop me from doing, well, that's not okay. That is not the libertarian standpoint. So we've already got a level of disingenuousness. This guy doesn't understand the thing that he's attacking here. Clearly. <laughs> this definition is limited as it can still be coherently applied in papers like this, which argue for expanding the notion of harm to encompass harmful speech, thereby allowing governments to censor it. How do you bring something like this up and then not realize that you are advocating... You, you understand, at least we, we think you understand, based on putting up this paper, on, that the censorship of speech thing can happen and that it's not good. But then you're talking about we need to control people's behavior. Dude, you're, you don't understand that you're, you're both like acknowledging that you can't do this and then saying, but we need to do this. And seeing as Mill established his harm principle to defend free speech in the first place, this seems like a major failing in the wording and, and uh, spirit of his definition. This half-baked principle... Well, the problem is that you don't seem to have understood what was being said. Direct physical harm is something you pulled out of your ass. ...has provided a philosophical justification for the slippery slope our civilization has found itself on. Mm -hmm. I understand, though. This idea that as long as something only causes harm to the individual, doing it means that you can brush it aside is enticing. It no, that's not what was said. That's not at all what we were discussing. So we've moved the goalposts here. Originally, what we were talking about was the, a notion that if you want to do something, as long as it's not hurting someone else, the government shouldn't step in and tell you you can't do it. The government shouldn't intercept you and prevent you from doing the thing that you want to do. That's what we were discussing. But now the goalpost has moved. Now it's not about that. Gives us a wiggle room to ignore and dismiss our responsibilities to those around us. We don't have a responsibility to those around us. That is bullshit. No one is responsible for any of the other people around them. That is a cornerstone of liberty. That is the entire concept of freedom. Now, you may feel a sense of responsibility. You may ha engage in mutually beneficial transactions. You may make mutual agreements with e people, even unspoken agreements, that, hey, if, if I help you and you help me, then we're both better off for it. But in doing so, I expect certain things of you. You expect certain things of me. You can voluntarily take on those responsibilities. But when the government is forcing you to take on those responsibilities, that is tyranny. We have seen this tyranny. Get the vax. Wear the mask. You can't come to our country if you have not taken the product by the large drug company under emergency order for which they have no, repeat, no 
liability whatsoever. Why no liability? Who freaking knows? But the point is, if you suffer a lifelong disability because you don't take a medical intervention that's under emergency, blah, 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 then the government will penalize you. We've already seen this happen. You, you have a social responsibility to others. You have to fulfill it. But then here we are. This is 2023, January 2023 when I'm recording this. It's three years later. YouTube has discarded their policy where you can ask questions, where you're not allowed to ask questions about vaccines and masks. They have dumped the policy. Why have they dumped the policy? Because, oh, somehow the science that was settled changed, and now, you know, safe and effective somehow, <laughs> fairly quickly, if you ask me, became sudden and unexpected. All the clots and the heart attacks and all that stuff. And now we see articles about, oh, we should have COVID amnesty. A lot of people, one side, Made, said a lot of things that turned out to be wrong, so we should just forgive each other because this one side happens to have... Yeah, no. We, we've seen how this work plays out. We've already had the whole... You you have a responsibility to other people, so the government's going to make you do things because of that responsibility to other people. We've seen how that plays out. It is absolute tyranny, authoritarianism, it is as close as the United States has come to being run by literally Hitler. Moving on. No, I don't want to see a future on the world, and there's nothing but indulging pornography and video games. Is that not a type of harm he's inflicting on himself, even if it's not directly physical? You have the right to inflict harm on yourself. By doing nothing, are we enabling and implicitly endorsing their own self-destruction? By doing nothing, are we enabling someone at My bro, it is not enabling. You're not enabling because you don't have a responsibility to control another adult human being's life. We're not talking about 12-year-olds here. We're talking about adults. It is not your job to intervene in another adult's decision-making. Now, you can be concerned, you can show up and say, hey, I'm concerned for you, but ultimately, you do not, the government should not be telling you that you have to ever intervene in some other adult's life, because that's ultimately what this guy's advocating for. Uh, the government shouldn't be telling you to intervene, and if you intervene, it should be your choice, and they have the right to tell you to F off. To go away. Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. I'm doing it of my own free will. If I suffer and fall into the pit of flames, that's my choice. If I choose to suffer, that's my choice, not your choice. And even further, can we actually say for certain that no one outside of that person is harmed if a sizable chunk of society all decide to opt out at the same time as well? This is the problem that I have with this kind of argument. All of these moralistic arguments, ultimately, when you take out, when you apply the principle that you, that, that, that the harm, that if the harm is not being done by one person to another person, once you apply that principle and you say, okay, any harm that is not me on you harm, like you are not consenting and I am harming you, Outside of that, everything should be totally legal and fine. Once you establish that boundary, they always, and it, it's all of these authoritarian pricks that do this, they always fall back on this society is harmed argument. Well, here's the problem. Society is comprised of individuals. Society is not some sort of group that makes group decisions. It's a bunch of individuals that each have their own individual thoughts and ideas. You do not speak for anyone else but you. Your morality is not the morality of anyone else. It is yours and yours alone. Your decisions are yours. Your responsibilities are yours. They're not mine. They're not his, hers, it's, whatever. They're yours. The notion of societal harm, you open up the gate to, well, hey, who is it that makes that decision? It's always some other individual, some other individual that gets blessed, some other person that becomes the king of deciding who is harmed societally. Like, if I'm doing, a, if a, say I'm shooting up heroin, right? Let's just say that I'm doing hard drugs. And, so, okay, well, who decides that I can't 
shoot up the heroin? Who makes that decision and stops me? It's not my neighbor. They, they're not doing it. It's these blessed few that we've anointed as the friggin' pope of deciding who is harming society by doing things that they just don't like. Can we claim to be upholding our values if we don't at least say something? Well, you can say something, but you can't make me. You can't force people to say something. You can't have the government say something. And if you want to say something, then say something. But don't make it a legal problem. Don't make it some like if if I'm doing something and it's not hurting anyone but potentially myself. You can't argue that well because I'm part of society that I'm harming society by harming myself. Because that's ultimately what you're doing is saying that my choices harm others because I'm doing things you don't like. Well, it, let's just say you don't let's say you don't like furries or something like let's say you just do you think that anybody that enjoys drawings of anthro and I'm not bringing in the sexual element let's just my god my phones are making a lot of noise let's just say that you don't like the whole anthropomorphic animal cartoon thing period and you decide that this is a particular thing you don't like and that too many people do like it stop liking what I don't like Make your phones quiet. But let's say that that's the case, and that you go out and say, okay, it's societal harm, because I'm one of the anointed ones. I get to make these decisions. It's societal harm. I see too many people liking this thing that I think is depraved, or it, it's ungodly, or whatever. Okay, now you get to go out and tell everyone that stop liking what I don't like. That's what you're advocating for. You're saying that if someone else likes something you don't like, that you should be able to stop them. But I guarantee you, if we flip these roles around, you're going to say, now wait a minute, okay, that's not what I meant. I, d I didn't mean that if it's going to be someone else using that same judgment power against me, because I'm the one who's right. I'm the morally good person here. You're not. I am. I should have that power, not you, you stupid pleb, you dumb commoner. I'm the one who is morally good here. I know what's best for you. I should have the power to make that decision for you. I don't think we can. Change may be an internal process and can really only come down to whether the individual wants to change or not, but it is harder to take that first step without genuine support and encouragement from others. Acknowledging that this is a societal problem makes what I think even clearer. If it's a societal problem, it's really just something that you've decided is a societal problem. This is ultimately the thing. If you want to intervene, intervene, but don't make it my responsibility. And you, this this whole thing is kind of straight away from the whole victimless crime thing. They they're not talking about legality anymore. What they're really talking about is therapy. What they're talking about is intervention. Somebody needs to go in and help the drug addict stop being addicted to drugs. But we're talking in the original video that he was referencing. He's talking about victimless crimes, and he's arguing that if somebody does something that he doesn't like, that basically it should be illegal. That we should intervene. You don't get to put your morals out there through the government. And that's just it. You, you, it is not the government's place to decide that if I do something that doesn't hurt anyone, that I shouldn't be allowed to do that thing. Now, you can socially pressure me. Fine. Whatever. You can be one of those annoying Christian motherfuckers that comes up and says, I, I'm a Jesus freak, and if you're not equally a Jesus freak, in the way that I am, and the you know you don't fall in line with what I want, then I'm going to harass you in front of everybody else in society. You can put that pressure on other people if that's your choice, and they have the option to just not listen to you and to tell other people you're a kook and agree with them and walk away from you. But when you bring it into the government, when you go victimless crime, well, we're talking about crime. Crime is not something that just random people deal with. This is when you say crime you are invoking the government's police power. <clears throat> you are invoking the judgment of the government, no matter what it is. It, it's not a crime if the government doesn't intervene and arrest you and, and try you. Th that is how a crime works. It is no longer a crime if we're talking about it in this sort of therapeutic context. If we're not, ta if, let's say you're somewhere 
that hard drugs are legal, but you have a drug problem. Let's say you're in Vegas and you have a gambling problem. You know, if you have one of these vices and you need help to get out of it, what are you supposed to do? Well, the law doesn't is not supposed to come in and say, we're going to throw you in jail, strap you with a nice big fat criminal record, and, and then you'll get the help you need. No, that's something that has to be entered into voluntarily. Or at a minimum, they need to be socially pressured into it. It's not something where the government should intervene. Period. There is definitely a category of crimes that are, in fact, victimless. Which they do boil down to just behavioral regulation in service to a specific subset of society who is anointed with the powers, morality. <clears throat> and that morality will never be fixed over time. Back in the 50s and 60s, that morality decided that black people were lesser people than white people. Just as one example, you know, a hundred years ago, women were lesser than men. They were not full humans, they were basically uh, property for the most part, the way that they were treated. And I don't want to get into that discussion here. Um, I also am not as well educated on the details of that, so that's not what I'm trying to argue. I'm trying to argue that the morality of humanity does change over time, and codifying your morality into law is not appropriate. The only time that it is appropriate is when there is actual harm, measurable harm being caused to someone else by deprivation of their life, liberty, and property, and or property. That is the only appropriate time for something to be declared criminal. If you're not hurting anyone, you should not be at any risk of going to jail or prison. You should not be at risk of fines. You should not be at risk of any form of punishment or censure by any government, agency, or body, period. Other people can dislike what you do. They can hate you. They can hate you for it. They can hate what you do. They are free to do that. They are free to express their hatred of you and the actions that you take. But at the end of the day, they should be free to be reprehensible but harmless. I'm Jody Bruce on politics. Bye for now. Thanks for watching.